So we're going to be continuing with chapter 9. Um, this is part B. If you haven't seen the first part, please be sure to view that. Uh, you can find the link uh, in the comments below. Also, it's going to be in the playlist. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, be sure to subscribe. And let's begin. So uh, in this uh, section, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, whole muscles. We're going to be continuing with that. So in the previous uh, lesson, we learned about uh, the principles uh, of contraction to single fibers, uh, single muscle fibers. Now, that principle, it also applies to entire muscles as well, okay, to the whole muscles. Now, contraction, it produces muscle tension. And muscle tension, this is the force that's exerted on a load or object that needs to be moved. Now, contraction, uh, it may or it may not shorten the muscle. Now, when a contraction uh, does shorten the muscle, we say that it's an isotonic contraction because what happens is uh, the muscle is shortening because the tension of the muscle, it exceeds that of the load. Now, in an isometric contraction, the muscle does not shorten because the tension, it increases, but it's not exceeding that of the load. So for example, if trying to, you're, you're trying to lift up something that's super heavy, uh, I don't know, let's, for example, you're trying to pick up a truck. Now, your muscles are gonna, you know, they're gonna contract, uh, but it's not gonna shorten because, you know, there's no way that you can lift up an entire truck. Uh, so again, the force that's, uh, the tension that's generated, it's not gonna exceed that of the load. It's not gonna exceed that of the truck. But if you were to pick up, you know, a gallon of milk, uh, your muscle will shorten. So that would be an example of this isotonic contraction. Now, force and duration of the contraction, they vary in response to the stimuli of different frequencies and intensities. Now, each muscle, it's served by at least one motor nerve. And the motor nerve, it contains axons of up to hundreds of motor neurons. And we saw a little some of this in the previous lecture. So again, please be sure to view that if you haven't seen it already. Now, the axon, it branches into terminals in each ends up forming a neuromuscular junction with uh, single muscle fibers. So the motor unit, this is the nerve muscles functional unit. So motor units, they consist of a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it supplies. And there could be anywhere from four to several hundred muscle fibers. Now the smaller the fiber number, the greater the fine control. Now muscle fibers from a motor unit, they are spread throughout the whole muscle. So stimulation of a single motor unit, it causes only a weak contraction of an entire muscle. And this is important in, in preventing fatigue. So it's uh, like an on-off switch. So in this illustration here, uh, we see the axon of motor neurons that are extending from the spinal cord here. So you have a couple of motor units here, and then you can see uh, this is a muscle fiber over here, and then you can see uh, the neuromuscular junction you have so essentially you have this axon and then the axon just starts to branching into uh, several axon terminals so you got a terminal here there 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 uh, and then uh, so each one of these you know they'll stimulate the muscle fibers so muscle twitch now this is the simplest contraction that results from a muscle fibers response to a single action potential from a motor neuron the muscle fibers they contract quickly and then it relaxes this twitch, we can observe it and record it as a myogram. And what we see on a myogram are tracing. So this is the lines that are recording the contraction activity. And there's three phases of a muscle twitch. The first one, this latent period, these are the events that are occurring at the, during, the, during the EC coupling. Uh, so there's no muscle tension that we see here at this point. And then you have this period of contraction. And during the period of contraction, we have the cross bridge uh, formation taking place. And at this point, we're going to see tension increasing. Then you have this uh, period of relaxation. And during this period, what you're having is uh, all the calcium is going back into the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So tension, it declines back to zero. So what we're going to see on these, uh, the myograms is that muscle contracts in much faster than it does take time for it to relax. So in this uh, um, graph over here, uh, so right over here, this is uh, where there's no stimulus over here. So again, uh, this is this uh, latent period. And then you can see that uh, during the period of contraction, the tension is rising. And again, so this shows you the, the, the percentage of tension over here. And then this part over here, this shows you time in milliseconds. Um, so notice how fast you have the contraction that takes place. Again, it goes from roughly, oh, I don't know, I'm going to call this about perhaps two milliseconds or, or three milliseconds. And then uh, the peak uh, of a uh, period of contraction it occurs right around 30 milliseconds. So this occurs quite quickly, all right? But now look at the time it takes for 
uh, uh, muscle relaxation to go back from this peak tension back to zero. Uh, so it's almost about 100 and, well, if this is peak over here, and uh, if this is 30, and we're at 140, so it takes about 110 milliseconds for it to, to, to go back to zero. Uh, where it, you know, it took, uh, again, this is milliseconds, millions of a second. It took uh, uh, roughly, again, I would say about 27 milliseconds for it to reach, uh, reach uh, this uh, peak period of contraction. Uh, so that's quite significant. The differences in strength and duration of twitches, they are due to the variations in the metabolic properties and enzymes between the muscles. So for example, uh, your eye muscles contractions, these are rapid and they're brief. Whereas when you look at your, the muscles of your calf, which are large and fleshy muscles, they contract more slowly and they hold it much longer. So in this uh, uh, myogram here, you can see uh, this blue line is representing an eye muscle over here. And look how short it is. And uh, again, uh, the, the time it takes is, is quite uh, short uh, compared to uh, the muscles in your, your leg, your uh, gastrocnemius muscle and the soleus muscle over here. Uh, so if you notice, uh, it takes much, much, much longer time for a peak contraction to occur than also for the relaxation phase. Now, muscle twitch is seen only in lab settings or when you have neuromuscular power problems, but not in normal muscles. Instead, in healthy muscles, contractions are relatively smooth and they vary in strength as different demands are placed on them. Now, these variations needed for proper control of skeletal mu muscle movements, this is what's referred to as this graded muscle response. And in general, muscle contraction, it can be graded in two ways. The first is by changing the frequency of stimulation, and the second is by changing the strength of stimulation. So we're going to be looking now at the first one, the muscle response to change in stimulus frequency. And so if you have a single stimulus, this is going to result in a single contractile response. So a perfect example is a muscle twitch. So over here, again, when you look over here, uh, this air upward arrow, it represents a, a stimulus. And notice there's only one, so we're going to say there's a single stimulus that's, a, uh, that's uh, being applied. So when you have a single stimulus, you end up having a contraction followed by the relaxation. So remember, uh, what's going on over here, you're having a EC coupling over here, and then you have the tension that's being generated here, right? You have the contraction. Uh, and then over here, you have relaxation. What you're having at this point over here is you're getting the calcium that's being sent back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then eventually, you end up having uh, zero tension. So this is when you have the relaxed state. Now in wave summation or uh, temporal summation, this results of two stimuli that are received by a muscle in rapid succession. So the muscle fibers, they don't have time to completely relax between the stimuli. So the twitches increase in force with each stimulus. Uh, additional calcium that's released with the second stimulus, it just stimulates more shortening. And it ends up producing the smooth continuous contraction that adds up. This is why you call it a summation. Now, further increases in stimulus frequency causes muscles to progress to a sustained quivering contraction that we call this uh, incomplete tetanus or an unfused tetanus. So if you look over here in this, uh, 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 this um, myogram over here, this illustration, what you see is this, uh, these are all, this, again, this where the stimulus are being applied, where you, where you see these arrows. So in, at this first stimulus, again, you end up getting contraction. But now remember, during this period of relaxation, there's not complete relaxation that's occurred. And then a very short time later, a second stimulus uh, is applied. So remember, what's happening over here is, uh, uh, during relaxation stage, is that the, uh, the calcium is starting to go back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Well, not all the calcium has been sent back, so you still have some uh, calcium that's left. That's, uh, that's, that's there. And, but when you have the second stimulus that's applied, you end up getting an additional flood of calcium. So um, this is going to cause this, uh, again, this, the tension to increase now. All right? Now the same thing happens. As uh, you end up getting a, a contraction uh, and then, or higher tension over here that results, and then it starts to relax again. But, bef but again, before it completely relaxes, an additional stimulus is, is, is added. And then this is going to cause it to go uh, even more. You, you end up even having greater tension. So you end up having uh, this, what we see is this is what we end up calling this is summation. Now, if the stimulus frequency increases, muscle tension reaches maximum. And this is referred to as a fuse or a complete tetanus because the contraction it's fused into one smooth, sustained contraction plateau. And this prolonged muscle contraction, it ends up leading to muscle fatigue. So if you look over here, what you just ended up having is this very, again, these very short time intervals where you end up getting the stimulus. And then you end up having this, this contraction plateau that takes place over here, or this sustained, this fused 
tetanus. Now, this doesn't happen in real life, or it happens extremely rare. So, for example, uh, you know, you're walking down the street and there's a car accident, and then you see, you know, somebody that's that's trapped underneath uh, a big truck. So you rush to the scene, and you know, all of a sudden, you get this superhuman strength, and you just kind of push this truck off the person, and you know, you know. Uh, so you end up essentially what's happening. You end up, you know, pushing this two thousand pound, three thousand pound vehicle, uh, and this is when you're going to see this uh, this uh, tetanus that takes place. Okay, this this fused tetanus. Now let's look at muscle response to changes in stimulus strength. So in the previous example, in wave submission, we saw that it contributes to contractile force, but its primary function is to produce this smooth, continuous muscle contractions by rapidly stimulating a specific number of muscle cells. Now the force of contraction it's controlled more precisely by recruitment. This is also called uh, multiple motor unit summation. Let's look at the types of stimulus that are involved in recruitment. So at a sub-threshold stimulus, the stimulus is not strong enough, so there's no contraction that's seen. Now in threshold stimulus, the stimulus is strong enough to cause the first observable contraction. And in maximum stimulus, this is the strongest stimulus that increases maximum contractile force. In other words, what we're seeing here is that all the motor units, they've been recruited. So when we look at this uh, this diagram over here, um, you can see this uh, is showing you stimulus voltage, and this is showing you the uh, stimuli to uh, the nerve stimulus strength. So what we have over here is this: uh, when the 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 voltage, when the threshold stimulus has not been reached, uh, you, there's no uh, the motor units they haven't been excited. Okay, you haven't recruited anything. All right. So if you look over here, over here at these two, where the, 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 the voltage is less than this uh, threshold that's needed, nothing happens, right? But when you hit this minimum threshold stimulus, at that point, then you recruit, in this case, they're showing you two uh, muscle fibers over here uh, that have been recruited. And then as this increases, all right, now you have, uh, uh, so again, if you look over here, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so regardless, what the point is to understand is as more voltage is applied, uh, the number of uh, motor units that you're going to be recruiting will increase as well. However, you get to a point, and this point, uh, for example, when you get to this maximum uh, uh, stimulus, okay, uh, that that's reached, regardless of if you apply more uh, voltage or not, or more stimulus applied, you're not going to increase the number of motor units. Okay, that's you know you have excited. Once you hit this point, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, recruit any more. Uh, this is its, its maximum st stimulus. Okay, this is all it can take, and this is you're not going to end up getting any more work in return. So over here, you can see this uh, also over here. So is this showing you the strength of the muscle contraction over here? Uh, and again, this is time, and this is showing you the, uh, the tension. So again, when there is a tiny bit of uh, stimulus is applied, okay, we're showing over here, over here. Not much happens, but then right over here, when you get to this minimum threshold, then you see this first contraction, this very weak contraction. Then as more is applied, you see a, a, a larger contraction. And then again, uh, as you go up, you, you give it a, a lot more uh, uh, stimulus, as you increase the voltage, uh, more units are, are recruited. So again, you'll get uh, more tension that's generated. So this is what's shown over here. Now, recruitment works on the size principle. So motor units with the smallest muscle fibers, they're recruited first. As the stimulus intensity increases, the motor units with larger and larger fibers are recruited. Now, the largest motor units, they're activated only for the most powerful contractions. Motor units and muscles usually contract asynchronously, and this is done to help prevent fatigue. So while some fibers are contracting, others will rest. So you can see in this illustration here that as, uh, as time goes on and as stimulus intensity increases, uh, the larger and larger fibers are recruited. Now let's take a look at muscle tone. Now, although skeletal muscles are described as being voluntary, even when they are relaxed, they're almost always in a slightly contracted state, and this is called muscle tone. Now, this is due to the spinal reflexes that activate first one group of motor units, and then another in response to activation of these stretch receptors in the muscle. Now, while muscle tone doesn't produce active movements, it does keep the muscle firm, healthy, and ready to respond to stimulation. In addition to that, muscle tone, it also helps stabilize joints and maintains posture. Now, earlier on, we talked about isotonic and isometric contractions. So now let's look at these in a little bit more detail. So the very first one, isotonic contraction, this is when the muscle changes in length and is able to move a load. Now, isotonic contraction, it can be either one of two kinds. It could be either concentric or eccentric. Now, concentric contraction, this is when the muscle shortens and it does the work. 
Now, eccentric is when the muscle lengthens and it generates the force. So, uh, the perfect example would be your biceps muscle. So, uh, for example, if you you extend your arm outwards and uh, you, I don't know, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, you pick up a, a book, for example, and you flex it. You, you flex your, your forearm. So, you know, you're bringing your arm towards your chin, towards your face. What happens is that the bicep muscle, it shortens up and it starts to bulge out. This is an, this is an example of this concentric contraction. And then as you extend your arm back out, okay, to lay the book back on the desk, then that's an example of this eccentric contraction. The muscle is lengthening, and as it lengthens, it's still doing work, it's still generating force. Uh, if you want, go ahead, pick up a book, place your uh, your other arm on your bicep muscle, and feel that muscle as uh, uh, as it's shortening, and then also when it, as it's lengthening, you'll be able to feel uh, the, both uh, uh, concentric and eccentric contractions taking place. So in this illustration over here, uh, you can see this muscle is starting to shorten up. So this is an example of this uh, uh, concentric contraction. It's an isotonic contraction. Now an isometric contraction. The load is greater than the maximum tension the muscle can generate. So the muscle doesn't shorten nor does it lengthen. Electrochemical and mechanical events, they're the same in both isotonic and isometric contractions. But the results, they're different. In isotonic contractions, the actin filaments, they shorten, they cause movement. In isometric contractions, the cross bridges, they generate force, but the actin filaments, they don't shorten. What's happening there is that the myosin heads, they're just spinning on the same actin binding sites. So this is trying to show you an example of what happens in this isometric contraction. So let me give you an, a, a better illustration uh, in your mind. So again, let's remember we took that analogy of when you picked up a book and then you know um, you, you flex your arm and then you try to bring it up to your chest. Now, and that we said was uh, an example of uh, isotonic contraction. Now an isometric contraction, instead of picking a book, pick up an, an empty glass, okay? Pick up that empty glass and bring that glass to the middle of your body. To, to rotate your arm uh, medially, um, your forearm, to bring it towards, like, you know, as you're, you're about to drink it, okay? So bring it towards your chin, for example. Now, before it reaches your chin, just hold it there, uh, about halfway there, and then pick up a pitcher in another hand and start filling that glass up. Now, as more and more water uh, starts to fill up that glass, what's happening is the load, okay, that uh, on that muscle, that's holding that glass, it's starting to increase. However, there's no change in the, your, the, the joint angle, all right? So essentially what's happening is uh, in isometric contraction, the workload increases, okay, or the muscle load increases without having any change in the, the, the joint angle. So this is essentially isometric contraction. In a nutshell, this is what happens. Now let's take a look at the energy requirements that are needed for muscles to contract. So ATP is what supplies the energy that's needed for muscle fibers to be able to uh, move and detach the cross bridges. Uh, ATP is what allows calcium to be, to be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it also pumps sodium out of the cell and potassium back into the cell after EC coupling. Uh, now these ATP stores, they get uh, depleted quite quickly, uh, and that usually takes anywhere from four to six seconds. So ATP, it has to be available and it needs to be regenerated quite quickly if you want contractions to continue. So ATP is regenerated quickly by three mechanisms. The first one is direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. The second is this anaerobic pathway, uh, where you have glycolysis and lactate acid fat formation. And the third is through aerobic respiration. In direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate, what we have going on is the following. We have creatine phosphate, which is a molecule that we find only in muscle fibers. And what creatine phosphate does is that it donates a phosphate to ADP to instantly form ATP. Now creatine kinase, this is an enzyme that carries out the transfer of the phosphate. So muscle fibers, they have enough ATP and, and creatine phosphate reserves to power a cell for about 15 seconds. So we're going to be looking at how this happens, but essentially what ends up happening is creatine phosphate and ADP eventually turns into ATP and creatine. So over here, uh, imagine creatine kinase over here. Creatine kinase is going to come in and from this creatine phosphate, take this phosphorus and transfer it to this ADP molecule to form ATP. Now we have ATP and creatine. The other way that uh, ATP is produced is by uh, breaking down and using energy that's stored in glucose. Now this comes in 
one of two forms. Uh, the first form is when there is uh, when there is not any oxygen present. Uh, when there is not any oxygen or sufficient oxygen present, uh, the pathway that's used is this anaerobic pathway. Uh, when there is enough path, uh, oxygen available, then the pathway that goes is this aerobic pathway. So we're going to be looking at this first one, this anaerobic pathway. So we have glycolysis and lactic acid formation. Now what happens in glycolysis is that the glucose gets broken down and it ends up getting converted into two pyruvic acid molecules. Uh, when this happens, you also get two ATP molecules that are generated. So whenever you break down glucose, you end up with, in glycolysis, you end up getting uh, two ATP molecules and two molecules of pyruvic acid. Now, because there's low levels of oxygen, that pyruvic acid, uh, it cannot enter the aerobic respiration phase. So normally, the pyruvic acid, it would enter the mitochondria. And remember what the mitochondria was. It's the powerhouse of the cell. So if there was oxygen present, the uh, pyruvic acid would enter the mitochondria, and then it would start to uh, undergo aerobic respiration phase. However, at these high-intensity activities, oxygen is just not available. So like uh, when the bulging muscles, they compress the blood vessels, this impairs this oxygen delivery. Now, in the absence of oxygen, which is referred to as anaerobic glycolysis, the pyruvic acid, it gets converted into lactic acid. Now, lactic acid, it diffuses back into the bloodstream, and then it gets used as fuel by your liver, kidneys, and heart. Uh, the lactic acid also, it'll get converted back into pyruvic acid or glucose by the liver. Now, anaerobic respiration, it yields only 5% as much ATP as aerobic respiration, but uh, it produces ATP two and a half times faster. So in this illustration, what they're showing you is this. We have glucose, and in the side of the cell of the cell, it gets uh, converted into pyruvic acid. Okay, and this state, uh, this is its glycolysis stage. Okay, so when you break down glucose, you end up forming pyruvic acid. Okay, so you end up having two pyruvic acid, and you have uh, two ATP that you've gained for each glucose molecule. Now, because there is no oxygen present, what's going to happen is that this pyruvic acid will get converted into lactic acid, and then it ends up getting resorbed back into the bloodstream, and then it'll go to the liver, your heart, kidneys, and it'll be used as fuel. The liver will convert it back into pyruvic acid and send it back out, and hopefully if there is oxygen present, then it could be used uh, to fuel, uh, to, uh, to produce a more ATP. Now, in the aerobic process, or so aerobic respiration, now this produces 95% of the ATP during rest and light to moderate exercise. Now, this is slower than anaerobic, uh, the, than the anaerobic pathway, uh, but again, it yields a lot more ATP. So you net 32 ATP molecules through the aerobic pathway, whereas in the anaerobic pathway, we netted only uh, two ATP molecules. So there's a huge difference. So uh, this aerobic pathway, uh, pathway, it consists of a series of chemical reactions that occurs in the mitochondria. Now, this is oxygen re requiring, which is why it's called an aerobic pathway. It's aerobic respiration. So it breaks down glucose into carbon dioxide, water, and a large amount of ATP is produced. Uh, so again, rough 30 to be net 32 ATP molecules. And fuels used include glucose from glycogen that are stored in muscle fibers. Uh, then you have the blood-borne glucose. And then finally, you have the free fatty acids. Now, these free fatty acids, these are the main fuel that your body uses after 30 minutes of exercise. When you look at this uh, illustration here, it's showing you that, again, we have glucose. And the glucose, it gets broken down into pyruvic acid. Uh, then, again, when you have oxygen that's present, what's going to happen is the pyruvic acid, it will enter the mitochondria of the cell. And then through a handful of other chemical reactions uh, that'll take place over here and that takes place here, uh, you end up netting a total of 32 ATP molecules. When we look at the energy systems used during sports, so aerobic endurance, now in people that are conditioned, this can last for hours. And what we're describing is this in aerobic endurance. This is the length of time the muscles, they contract using the aerobic pathways. So as long as there's an oxygen is present, then again, your muscles can continue to work in this four hours. Now, the point where m the muscle metabolism, it switches over to the anaerobic pathway, this is what we call this anaerobic threshold, okay? So when you move from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration, at that point, that's this anaerobic threshold. So what this illustration is showing you this. So in short durations of high intensity exercise, the ATP that's stored in, in your muscles is ends up using first. Then uh, ATP that's formed 
from creatine phosphate ends up getting used, followed by glycogen that's stored in the muscles uh, that end up getting broken down uh, to glucose to produce ATP. All right. So again, during short durations, high intensity exercise, this is what's going to be used. However, in longer prolonged exercises, uh, prolonged durations, uh, the ATP that's generated is going to be used by breaking down several nutrients uh, through the aerobic pathway. Now, muscle fatigue is a physiological inability for muscles to contract despite continued stimulation. Now, this usually occurs when there's an ionic imbalance of your levels of potassium, calcium, or phosphorus, and this causes an interference with your EC coupling. Now, prolonged exercises, it could also damage your sarcoplasm reticulum, and it interferes with calcium regulation and release. Lack of ATP is rarely a reason for fatigue, with the exception of severely stressed muscles. Now, let's look at the conditions that are required for uh, the muscles to return to its pre-exercise state. So the first thing that needs to happen is this oxygen reserves, they need to be replenished. Uh, lactic acid, it has to be reconverted back to pyruvic acid. Uh, the glycogen stores, they need to be replenished. ATP and creatine phosphate reserves, they need to be resynthesized as well. Now all these replenishing steps, they require extra oxygen. So this is referred to as this access post-exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC. And this used to be called oxygen debt. And that's it for the second part of chapter 9. If you haven't seen the first part, please be sure to view that. You can find that in the comments below as well as uh, viewing it in the, in the playlist. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me directly or leave, it, uh, leave your questions in the comments below. Uh, and also, please be sure to share with your friends uh, and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Thank you much for watching.